But it must have felt sweet seeing those premature headlines already declaring oh, your yeah. loss, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. And then as you start gaining points and by, you know, the last couple she of days, you, you knew already, like, the Katie yes. Herzog her headlines and The Stranger, Oh, my God. You know? It wasn't that hours before we it was, went ahead? It, it was, was really bad. Quick. I mean, there has to be some, like, yeah. There was. I mean, yes, on a on a on just a human, personal human <laughs> level, it was... Uh, I can't use these words on, <laughs> but the word starts with the the word start with the letter F and the letter Y. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here with Chrissy. Hello. Aretha. Hello. Myra. Hi. We are here on the Black Friday edition of Activist Class with Council <laughs> Member Shama Sawant. Yeah. Newly elected, three and zero in city council races. Undefeated. Undefeated in council the races. The Slayer of Amazon. <laughs> Not me, but us. The original person who. Came up with <laughs> that <you>. slogan. <laughs> Who's the one who uses it now? Bernie. Oh yeah, Bernie. Well, that's that makes we'll sense. He can lend it. it. He can lend oh, it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We'll we want it. we want them to to say that it's having a huge impact. Mm -hmm. I think in what you obviously excel in confidence and knowing the issues and not wavering towards anything even the moderate liberal <laughs> party has to say. It you are somebody in my opinion who seems to be always on mm -hmm. and. I don't I think people see like that version of you most of the time obviously people who don't have like a personal relationship with you um, is it hard to kind of turn that off sometimes kind of like take a moment and rest in a time where things are more polarizing than ever it seems like there's it's a constant an, attack right endless right. amount of issues to advocate for and that's also speaking I think for many of us here who I think personally have a hard time kind of finding time yeah. to take a take a pause and we're gonna ask you your self-care regimen sure we're always having to be on always having to like hold the line in every space you are and i'm sure you get tired <laughs> so like how do you take care of yourself like what do you do that like gives you joy and like feeds your soul i love cooking mm -hmm. aretha knows this yes, we've talked yes. about this before <laughs> uh and so even even in fact surprisingly even during the campaign as, as intense as it was, we hardly ate out because that was my way of dealing with everyday stress, like coming home and totally just uh, letting go. And and I'm um, and Calvin knows this. I'm I'm notoriously <laughs> fond of mysteries. I'm so <laughs> really? fond of mysteries that I will also like Calvin has pointed out <laughs> that, that, that I sometimes have low standards because just because it's a mystery, I'll I'll, I'll listen that to it amazing. or watch it. I so I, I listen to audiobooks audio while I'm cooking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, is this yeah. like a crime podcast? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is the realm? No. I mean, if there's a crime podcast, you need to tell me about oh it. Oh my god, there are a lot. there's, yeah. there's yeah. You'll never leave a house. lot of murder happening in the there's world. A, no Game of Thrones. <laughs> I love Game of Thrones. No! What? Yeah. Whoa, you know, I mean, just, canceled. Yeah, here's, here's, here's the deal, here's the deal. What? I don't like Game of Thrones, Myra. I'm just joking. I love Game of Thrones. No, we love Game of Thrones. Wow! So we did have me in the same for, category well, as Myra. I have to tell you, I, don't, I am not into fantasy. Oh. No, I mean... Mystery, but no fantasy. No. Facts. The only reason only I like Game of Thrones... I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but gotta be She's honest. She's a woman of facts. I mean, yes. But I love Game of Thrones because it's so political yeah. mm -hmm. that I enjoy it despite the fact, like I yeah. tolerate the fantasy part because it's that so political. Is, wait, did you did you read Hunger Games or watch the movies? I haven't, but Calvin's been trying to convince me to Oh, they're so it. good. They're good? Yeah, they're good, yeah. But most people probably would be surprised you haven't read Hunger Games, probably. Yes, yes. I might lose some cred on that. You know? <laughs> no, but you like Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. Which character do you identify the most with? Uh, <laughs> I mean... I mean, well, I don't even watch it. And I'm like, Mother of Dragons. <laughs> oh, that's no, you. Oh, she, no, her. she, no, she. Yeah, she oh, got kind of weird. Back? She got kind of weird. She gets sort of gets she into megalomania kind yeah. of thing. Jk, jk, right? jk. Yeah. Would you Scratch say that, that from the record? Me, it's like white savior, dude. You don't want to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. People, my friends always called me um, Littlefinger, which was an insult. Oof. I think. 
It's not really? true. What? <laughs> Why are you laughing, Calvin? <laughs> Is it because your head is shaped like a thumb? Huh? <laughs> it's like, you're not a little thing. I though. know. I feel like I'm more like I'm trying to uh, see who could ha- be a happy thing. guy. He was the real politic in the whole. Uh, mm, I would say I'm more of a Hodor, you know, friendly, friendly <laughs> giant. Sweet. Oh, I love Hodor. <laughs> Hodor is such a lovable yeah, character. Yeah, Shamusan loves Hodor. <laughs> you I, I, you first. Had first. Oh, I do. I do like uh, Tyrion Lannister. Oh, there you go. So, he's so smart, mm-hmm. and you know, in in a, in a in a world where everybody's survives on brawn mm-hmm. and like sort of fighting physically mm-hmm. he survives on his intellect yeah and i sort of identify mm. with that because <laughs> i feel like myself you know i am very untalented in so many ways that most regular people are like i am so not good at sports <laughs> i'm even a nervous Overrated. driver politics yeah. is politics. Driver. yes i can do politics you <laughs> see know? and i think that's a misconception <laughs> like People think that those of us who are like on the left left aren't like, you know, obviously we don't we acknowledge that the political system is built upon white supremacy, et cetera, et cetera. But we do love po- politics. You know, we love the scheming aspect. We love the strategy, maybe, as strategy. I would say. Strategy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Choose your right. words. Oh, 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 there he is. <laughs> you know, the politics, the strategizing, the organizing. Yeah. You, you you like that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And that was another thing. I mean, Rita was asking, you know, what do you do for self care? Obviously, we, you know, I do do other things that I mentioned, you know, cooking and mystery and all that stuff. But also, just the organizing and the politics is also yeah. energizing. Mm-hmm. And it's when you know when uh, you know when when you're able to really see a movement coming together it gives you so much yeah. joy so it's like yeah. it can be physically exhausting but it's still mentally stimulating the heart is full mm-hmm. the heart is full the yes. heart is full <laughs> but tired yes <laughs> so the council the new one the the new guard coming in are you excited yeah for sure i also don't think that means uh it gives any rest to the movement mm-hmm. because i fully expect that even with the new council, it will really come down to movement building and you know, really building fighting movements. Because no matter what progressive policies we want to organize around, whether it's a Green New Deal or taxing big business, which actually you need for the Green New Deal, otherwise you won't be able to fund the Green mm-hmm. New Deal, or rent control, <coughs> all of this will bring up such phenomenal opposition from the corporate elite Mm -hmm. we you will see i mean we already saw this right even well-meaning elected representatives sometimes will give in Mm -hmm. and so even if even if you assume the best of intentions from elected representatives you were really really demonized on the campaign and called a bully and divisive Um, But we know that the pressure that business puts in your office, especially the pushback around something like a a tax and a head tax, must have been not um, like (laughs) roses and daisies. You can describe them the same way. Yeah. Can well, I'm interested to hear what your description of their pressure um, on the council is like. How would you describe the the pressure from the business establishment? What does that look like? What does it sound like? It's interesting what you're asking because I was, you know, I was thinking about this a few days ago in response to a question a reporter asked, and I was realizing that before our movement, you know, following our first election and all of that in 2014, the fight for $15 an hour, before that, business, big business, and we have to make a distinction between small business and big business, of course, large corporations, they were getting their way then to... But there was no fight because there was no clash because we didn't have really any forces to represent the marginalized, represent working people. So they still, they mean the large corporations, the multimillionaires, the billionaires, they always had a red carpet welcome at City Hall, but all of it happened quietly, you know, Mm. just just business as usual was chugging along the Seattle process Mm -hmm. as Brett Hamill has, you know, often called out. Mm-hmm. But it was it's when ordinary people win a seat in City Hall, <coughs> then we start getting organized. We bring we completely change the tenor of city council meetings. That's when uh, there's a backlash from big business and and yeah, I mean and and what does that pressure mm-hmm. look like? I mean, most of the time, 
un, it, it's interesting. F uh, you won't even hear about it from most council members, to be honest, mm. because they don't see it as, you know, f um, it, uh, in interests that are diametrically opposed to each other, and then the, them having to pick a side. Mm. They they want most. Unfortunately, most politicians want to see their role as trying to make peace mm. between the two. And they won't even tell you that they're having meetings with big business mm. often. And so we have changed, we've really broken that open. I mean, just to give you one example of this, when we first, when we did our first budget cycle uh, in 2014, that was our first year, we saw this, uh, you know, the uh, city clerk will give you a calendar for the whole budget, for the whole budget season. Mm -hmm. And we saw this item on some of those days which said chamber retreat. It was just normal. It was part of the official calendar from city hall, chamber retreat. And we were, my staff and I were like, what is this chamber retreat? Then we found out that council members and the mayor actually spend roughly $10,000 of taxpayer money to go to the Chamber of Commerce's retreat in Sancadia. Oh my God. And where, where pretty much they get their marching orders and it's timed just before the budget. Wow. Damn. And we completely put a stop to that because what, all we did, this was 2014, oh and all God. we did was we, we did our, our first People's Budget conf press conference said, did, you, did, did the public even know this was happening? Wow. And then, so basically all it required was publicly shaming yeah. these corporate politicians and they stopped doing it because mm. they didn't want to be called out mm. on it. So, I mean, in, 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 I'm it's probably not fully answering your question, but I'm no, trying to I say that are. it's not even pressure as in they don't even see it as pressure it's just business as usual so along those lines i mean i think we saw that in in the narrative that they used that they were solutions and you were ideology mm -hmm. and without ever recognizing that that socialism is an ideology but so is neoliberalism neoliberalism just exactly. happens to be the ideology that is invisible to us all and it's because it's like the dominant culture, it's the air that we breathe. Exactly. So can you break that down to the listeners? Like, can you describe what neoliberalism is in a way that can make sense to us? Absolutely. I mean, neoliberalism is basically, I would say, it's the um, dominant framework that is used in the context of capitalism today. Meaning when you see uh, r a routine, routine approach towards cutting taxes for big business, uh, a routine approach towards a chronic underfunding, for example, of public education, of the fact that there is, for example, in our city, we see uh, just uh, an epidemic of economic evictions, especially of black and brown working families. All of this is happening as a matter of course. It's not that, um, you know, somebody is trying to do that despite other forces opposing it, that is the norm. Mm -hmm. And so you're totally right, Chrissy, that, it, the, that both neoliberalism or capitalism, as you, you know, whatever you might want to call it, or socialism, they are ideologies, but they are also practical ideas. You know, whether you want to call it solutions or not depends on which side you're on, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for, for the elite, neoliberalism works mm -hmm. and so they consider that a solution so when trump gives amazon massive tax cuts that's their solution yeah. because that if their, their definition of the billionaire's definition of efficiency is cut as much cost as possible and pocket as much profit as possible so from that standpoint their ideology also comes with solutions mm -hmm. our ideology which and we're not we're never trying to hide that it's an idea. I mean, we mm -hmm. know we're not coy about uh, uh, socialism being a set of ideas. We are proud of it, and we're seeing the especially the millennial generation really drawn towards it because the system is not working the, as it is. It's not working for them. But for us, the ideology also presents solutions. Mm -hmm. So it is. Um, it's not that we don't have solutions. Obviously, when we when we are advocating for rent control or the need to tax large corporations to fund social housing and to fund public transit may being made free and massively expanded, expand wind and solar, 
all of these are solutions so when they say oh you're just ideology you don't have solutions what they're really saying is we don't want your solutions because your solutions are actually eating into our profits mm -hmm. right last episode we went through and talked about like moments that had radicalized us mm -hmm. like you know like there's a like, kind of like a star point where like oh shit like this is really fucked up um and like that catapulted us into the various sectors that we are so you know like you know what aspects of your childhood or your upbringing kind of or, or why you're fighting for what you're fighting right for. right yeah, right i don't know if they i can i mean i can share with you one or two incidents from my childhood but i don't know that any one moment was for sure. me like an aha moment mm -hmm. Uh, but it was exactly w along the lines of what you're suggesting through your question. It it was the experience of growing up in a neo-colonial neo country. I grew up in yep. Mumbai in India. Mm -hmm. And the experience of seeing just this absolute ocean of poverty and misery and you know and of course just like we have in the United States we have you know capitalism comes with racism. I mean, as Malcolm X says, you can't have capitalism without racism. Mm -hmm. Similarly, in India, the neoliberal capitalist regime cannot survive without dividing people along caste lines. And so you see this just a brutal system of caste violence and um, and that also sort of being coupled with sexual violence. Mm -hmm. And not that I was processing all of this clearly as a kid, but you know, just yeah. observation yeah, of seeing that. The but, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but here's the deal though, and this is where the, it's not just, I, for, for, I think for most of us, it's obviously it starts with a sense of social justice and morality, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then it goes into logic as well. Because see, uh, for me, it was like, if, if our, the level of technology and human capability, you know, if we were talking about, if we were talk, having this conversation, obviously without this electronic e equipment, 10,000 years ago, it would be completely different because everybody was at a level where it simply the, you know, society was where it was. Mm -hmm. But for me, the question was yeah. clearly this ocean of poverty is coexisting alongside massive wealth for some people. So I just refuse to believe that it couldn't be equalized right. because yeah. clearly the system is capable mm -hmm. of producing so much wealth for some so why is it like that and then and then in the middle of both extremes were families like mine which were working class to middle class families but with parents who were working all hours who mm -hmm. lived yeah. You know, we never wanted for anything, but we were never rich by any means. And I could see my parents just living frugal lifestyles mm -hmm. themselves so that my sister and I could have everything. And then every generation engaging in that sacrifice yeah. for their younger generation. Yeah. And and mm -hmm. then you see all these, you know, multimillionaires and billionaires. It's just the yeah. whole thing was yeah. so messed up it, it was yeah. it's really just incredible mm -hmm. but i'll tell you one of the things that just did radicalize me is i refuse and as a kid i refused to go to sleep without a story <laughs> i was a real but no pain. fantasy oh. stories no no oh. no fantasy stories Wait. mystery mystery only mystery stories. <laughs> i loved so mysteries cute. then too but i wanted to be told a story by my mom mm. and she you know she was she was you know she spent her whole life she's retired now but she was mm. a teacher all her life wow. she had a long commute i mean mumbai is like new york mm. on steroids you know it's such yeah. a big city and so by the time we it was bedtime she was like i don't have the energy to read new yeah. books for you <laughs> and tell you new <laughs> stories but she was reading this political literature fiction oh but it gosh. was politicized because it was women's empowerment i'm gonna need the name of that the fight against gas violence and all yes. that so she would tell me stories which actually later on some of my friends in graduate school here in the u.s said were sort of scandalized like really your mom told you stories that was inappropriate for a kid i'm like Ooh. i think that was the most appropriate thing she did <laughs> oh, because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it really taught me that oh I'm not crazy for thinking about these things. Clearly, there's a whole mm. world of people out right. there who are thinking about right. that. Mm. Your mom still, does she search your name sometimes? Um, she does, she does. Oh. You All send the her time. some news clippings, you know? I, I do. Actually, my sister, uh, you know, my whole family lives in Bangalore, and they keep looking up, and they uh, they share things with her. Did they were like... You're trying to fight the richest man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> My mom calls me sometimes. She goes, are you yeah, at another same, protest? Same. You know, are, we yeah. have, My God. a lot of us have immigrant parents. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah. they, they know they're fluent in the struggle, mm -hmm, you know, right. but at the same time, we were just talking about this last week is like my mom's always like and you, did your mom live in hawaii or? in hawaii yeah mm -hmm. 
And our parents are always like, we didn't go through all of this for you to be on the street too. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Right. I know. And they're not in a, you know, they're in the same situation for the most part too. But yeah, no, I'm, you're right. I'm sure your mom is a mixture of proud and sometimes worry. She oh, does worry. Sure. Yeah, yeah sure. she does worry about, especially about security a little bit. Uh, but but you're right. I mean, I when I when I first got my and I don't often want to talk about PhDs or anything because you know yeah. I want people to feel like you don't need a PhD right. to, mm-hmm. to fight this fight. Certainly it's not. It's also dope you have a PhD. It's very dope. Huh? Yeah, it's good you have a PhD. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, it's fun for me to say to right wing people. You exactly. know, like yeah. you don't know you can have something. Like just. By, By the way, way. <laughs> that must feel so good. Can you please introduce yourself as Dr. Council Member? What's that? Can you please introduce yourself as Dr. Council Member? Yes, Dr. Council Member, exactly. I use it strategically <laughs> yeah. against political enemies. Yeah. But the thing is, when when I first was getting my PhD, you know, I it, it was a different time. It was like 10 years ago. Politically, the world is a different place, radically in some ways now. But but I, I, I got my PhD, I defended my dissertation, and at the same time, I joined Socialist Alternative, mm. and my family was like, "Wait, you're not getting a tenure track position, but mm. you're at, at a street corner selling a socialist newspaper." Oh my Wait, what is going on? <laughs> so that was my next question: was like, do your family do they do they talk do they talk to other family members about you and how cool you are, or do they do they want you to? Because remember when we were all talking about like what's the job that your parents wanted you to be, mm. and mm-hmm. these two were politicians. I was an engineer. I don't know what you were. Uh, this you mean in terms of what your parents wanted? Yeah, like the max. Like your parents wanted you to be an engineer. Yeah. Well, you're an architect. Now. I'm an architect. That's close like, enough. Yeah. Uh, she's a politician, super different. but she fucked but it up. She's a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you were also a politician? Oh, my parents no. Oh. What did your parents want you to be? Uh, you know. We didn't really have that conversation. They were really similar to Day's parents. They didn't really care what I was going to be as long as I made a bunch of money. Mm-hmm. Oh. Doctor and lawyer would no, have been fine. They didn't fine. want me to make mm-hmm. a bunch of money. They just, <laughs> like, they said. just wanted me to never worry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, because they of spent course. their whole yeah. life right. worrying no, it's about understandable. putting yeah, food course. on the table. So they're like, work hard enough yeah. so we like you can take care of yourself mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that's the only thing we care about that's and true. in their minds it's doctor lawyer because right. that's what society tells oh, absolutely. them absolutely right. yeah yeah but so there funny. were your parents excited when you first told them you want to get into politics uh well it, it's it sort of didn't work out quite that way because i it was not like i planned to enter politics right. per se right. the conventional idea of politics is running for office but that's what i that's not what i plan to do i did want to join i i was looking for uh, a political organization that fit my understanding of what was going on in society. It's just that I was too naive at that time to understand w- w- what I'm talking about is being a Marxist. I, I didn't know I was already on those lines. Unfortunately, because my family, as loving as it is, and I love my family to death, but they're not poli- they weren't political. Right. So right. I didn't grow up in a politicized family. I grew up in a very academically oriented mm-hmm. family and where mathematics was like sort of your key to your way out yeah yeah right. yeah exactly right. and i in, in a way i got lucky because i was always good at mathematics so i could sort of effortlessly do what sort of go with the flow of what you know what you're supposed to do mm-hmm. without uh, while still harboring some other ideas of what what you want to contribute to the world um and so in that sense it was okay but yeah i mean uh at first, it was quite difficult for my family to understand, I think. Mm. But this is what I mean, you know. The changing times influence not only the people who are, in, in, you know, sort of the advanced layers of activists. Mm-hmm. It influences everybody. So my family today is quite different from what they were 10 years ago because they are also being influenced by the events. Now, you know, this is post-Occupy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is also post the Google's worldwide Google one day strike against mm-hmm. sexual harassment. I mean, so they're seeing, mm-hmm. I mean, they come from, and I mean, I, and I, I, I also, you know, come from the world of tech workers and right, right. Uh, people who are, like you were saying, they, you know, p- people who are, who are not wanting for economic security, yeah. but they are also radicalizing. Mm-hmm. It's amazing, even in our campaign, that it was so along class lines between mm-hmm. our opponent and, and our campaign. You know, it wasn't just that, that the, he was being funded by the chamber packs. Mm-hmm. Even his own campaign was being, you know, he had donations from all these vice presidents and mm-hmm. corporate attorneys mm-hmm. from big tech. Mm-hmm. 
But our campaign was funded by tech workers, so the same corporation, yeah. the workers yeah. are on this side and yeah. the executives are on the other. So I think that's influenced my family also quite a bit. Yeah. So you're an introvert. I am. So how does how does introvert younger Shama Sawan, who is just fresh out of a PhD program, find socialist alternative? That was because I was, you know, this is the thing. I was in the tech field, mm -hmm. and as I said, I was good at what I was doing, but I was completely dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. And so, in all my naivety. I decided to enroll in an economics PhD program thinking, oh, that's going to tell me how to end poverty. Mm. And it did, in a way. <laughs> it gave me a solid Very education. Very yeah. thinking, <laughs> that's actually. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But except I didn't know that the economics discipline is basically the intellectual backbone of justifying capitalism. Yeah, exactly. So in a sense, yeah. I did get a solid education, but it it was in a perverse way. Like it didn't sh it didn't tell it it wasn't like I learned Marxist science mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. which I was hoping to. But it you did. had to go to Evergreen. Yes, oh you had to go to Evergreen. Chrissy. <laughs> exactly. Oh, exactly. You just, you just no, made the ad right there. Ever Evergreen. You should but sell that where, ad where to uh, Evergreen <laughs> at North Carolina State University. Okay. But it NC did State. give me a solid education in going against the stream. One, being getting used to the fact that you're the only one in the class mm. that is mm -hmm. go not going to agree with the professor. Mm -hmm. And I also went through the ridiculous experience of getting a C. I, and I'm so... I'm, oh. I, I, mean, I mean, I am intellect, uh. in, the intellectual you're in you here. You're still here first. Well, yeah. It's not so much bitter as in, in the sense that it was outrageous because yeah. from, from uh, an academic standard you know, from the point, standpoint of academic standards, mm -hmm. my work was never questionable, mm -hmm. but it was the political disagreement mm -hmm. that led, so it was like going through the hard experience of yeah. actually having to pay a price for... Mm -hmm. Your professor was a libertarian, huh? I was gonna say, who is this professor? That one, we'll that one was. Although, I knew uh, it, those fucking libertarians. We'll yeah. find your professor. I, 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 them, but, but, but here's the deal though, I also got incredibly lucky to find uh, a, both an advisor, a thesis advisor, and a dissertation committee who said, we know what your political views are, but as long as your work is up to the academic standards, we don't care. That is almost yeah. unheard of. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A C, though. <laughs> I did get they one gave, C. I did birth, get one C, yeah. They yeah. gave birth to... Uh, was, we haven't decided yeah. your Game of Thrones character yet. <laughs> yeah. but. The Brett, Brett Hamill said uh, I was a Jon Snow, but maybe... Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe because sure he didn't myself. want to be a pol politician, you know. In that sense, yes, yes. You want to get a king that doesn't want to be king. Like any South Asian kid out there that's listening is like, I can get a C. <laughs> <laughs> I have a yes, yes, yes. You can get a C, and yet you can stand up for working people exactly. and you can successfully build movements. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but yeah, your question was, how did I find social yeah, alternative? Yeah. So when I, so by that time, Questions. you know, I was, I, I was like, okay, I got a certain kind of education, and I learned how to. I mean, one thing it did give me is there's no right wing economist can, that can uh, win a debate. Uh, you know, once you have gone through that kind of rigorous training of going up against that opposition. But by that time, I was so ready to find an actual organization that represented my thinking. And so I was going to all these political meetings. And then at these political meetings, I would see these socialists <laughs> with their tables of books. <laughs> and so one day I was just perusing through the material and then somebody at that table said, hey, would you like to meet for a discussion? And I said, yes, I would like to. Thank you. And, and that was it. Never looked back. Mm, the Jehovah Witness tactic. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it's, the, it's, the, it's the agreement on uh, scientifically um, argued political ideas mm -hmm. technique. One of the critiques of the socialist alternative is that it is not intersectional or diverse. Can you speak to that? To be fair, so I think socialist movements in general, like especially like the bigger in Seattle, I want to say in, in, Seattle. in Seattle, but also is it just in Seattle? No, there, there's I some. I mean, Latin America has a huge like yeah. No, in, 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 yeah, in America, oh, in, in America. yeah, in America, in DC, I've heard similar critiques in the Bay Area, New York, um, and yeah. Anyway, uh, no, no. It's, Why it's, do you think so? Is that true? Then is the socialist alternative membership? majority white 
like major majority white? I don't know if it's major majority white, but yes, it is true that it's majority white. But it's also not etched in stone in the sense that when I joined Socialist Alternative 10 years ago, I don't know that there were any people of color other than maybe a few members who who are who are black and who have who had been members for several years before I joined and hardly any women mm -hmm. and since then i mean if you so if you compare where it was 10 years ago it has dramatically shifted now there's far mm -hmm. more people of color far more women and many uh, lgbtq people mm -hmm and who are openly LGBTQ, we have openly trans members. And in fact, two of our trans community members fr from Socialist Alternative, you know, Emerson Johnson and uh, Grayson Arbiter, uh, both played leading roles on the campaign, mm -hmm. you know, who were critical to the campaign. And so, and, and, and that doesn't, so it's, it's sort of a it's, a, it's a work in progress in the sense that I, uh, I definitely think that it is. Uh, we still have a, a ways to go, and we take that seriously. Like so, when if you were, were to attend socialist alternative meetings, we, uh, you know, in the in the conversation about building socialist alternative, we, that is always something that is a reminder to us that we have to <coughs> consciously approach these issues. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it is through that conscious building of the organization that we have. Now we have many more women, people of color, and LGBTQ members, as I said. But I also think that, on the whole, that also reflects what's happening in political movements in general. Mm -hmm. For example, if you look at the beginnings of, especially in Seattle, as you were saying, um, b you know, if you look at the beginnings, especially, and even today, I think, the bulk of the environmental movement is not people of color. Yes, here we have God it's green in organizations, it's but, very true. But, but statistically speaking, it's not true. Yeah. And I think that ref reflects the fact that some of the communities that face the most oppression, is it's hardest for them. That doesn't mean that they are not capable. In fact, mm -hmm. historically, it's when marginalized communities come to the forefront that movements gain enormous strength. But that, it, so we have to take that work seriously, but I also don't think that on the other hand, we should we should have a feeling that well, there's something especially problematic about socialist movement. For ex because if you look at the history of the socialist movement in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and yes, in Latin America, obviously it's led by Latin Americans. And I was thinking about the socialist movement in India is led by yeah. Indians. So yeah. in that sense, it's all people of color right, in, in, right. from our mm -hmm. context. But you're also right, Day, that you know we, there is something that we should approach consciously. But at the same time, we should be encouraged by the fact that if you look at the history of the Marxist movement and this broader socialist movement in the U.S., it was it, it actually the most the strongest moments of the movement came when it was led equally by white activists and people of color activists and in fact immigrant activists you know so so for example the the principal general strikes including the general strike in Minneapolis and so on which really gave the the character of the labor movement, it was led by Marxists. And who were those Marxists? They were not all white. Many of them were immigrant mm -hmm. people. And many of them also people of color. Um, and also, you know, uh, immigrants who, f who at that time faced serious racism in a way that we don't even see today. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is enormous potential. And in, in fact, it's not coincidental also that uh, Malcolm X and MLK who were both you know, major leaders of the black movement and the civil rights movement, were, uh, were, became the biggest threat to the establishment when they started mm -hmm. drawing socialist conclusions. Mm -hmm. So I totally think that's where we are going, mm -hmm. but it's not automatic either. You know, movement building is a conscious exercise where we have to take our own leadership seriously, mm -hmm. but also building others' leadership seriously. And that comes both inside. For us, it comes both through building socialist alternative and building the wider movement. And we don't see a contradiction between the two mm -hmm. things. So the 
the structure of and history of the socialist alternative in Seattle has historically been more white led, but you are taking a an initiative as an organization now to be more intersectional and more anti racist in your approach. Well, I I, I wouldn't say that we were ever not anti racist mm -hmm. because socialism is, is nothing if it's not anti racist. So you know, as you were say, referring to the ideology earlier, I mean the uh, the ideas of socialism demand fundamentally that we fight for a society that is free of any kind of oppression or exploitation and that is meaningless if you're not also fighting against racism so in that sense there's never a question for for me or anybody in socialist alternative that that's a society we are fighting for mm -hmm. but that also means that in order to build the socialist movement we have to consciously build in all communities in such a way that it's not it's not like a white socialist movement and then everyone else, mm -hmm. but yeah. actually working class people in general uh, coming together in a socialist movement where we are all united to fight against oppression. Mm -hmm. And that means not br obviously not brushing aside racism and saying, mm -hmm. oh, it's all about class. I mean, because that, yeah. that's not, that is not the correct approach. And mm -hmm. if there are, so, and, I know, I know th and I know that there are some sections of the international socialist movement that have that approach, but we don't agree with mm -hmm. that. That is why it's um, it's not, so it's again, it's not out of nowhere, for example, mm -hmm. that we were the only no vote on a police contract that clearly the black and brown community was saying, absolutely, this is outrageous that you would do this. So, uh, you know, it's not like we voted no or I voted we meaning the movement. I say mm -hmm. we because I don't want to make it about me. But it, it's it's not that I voted no because I got, you know, like some people gave me, made phone calls to me. It was internally within Socialist Alternative, we understood that clearly we could not vote, vote for such a police contract because what mm -hmm. does it mean for us to be socialists mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. if we're not going to stand on the front lines against a racist police department? So that's an, a concrete example of how we take that very seriously. But that doesn't mean that we are done with the work of really... Uh, you know, working with a wider movement. that That's an ongoing task for us. Mm -hmm. What have been some of the biggest lessons that you guys have learned? Mm. Um, like in general or? Yeah, I think like, I mean, speaking from my own experience, I know working within white-led institutions and also working within POC-led institutions, there's just definitely a difference in the culture. And I think doing culture change work is oftentimes even harder than being able to take a stance on policy, for instance, and knowing how to vote, right? So like, based on um, the fact that Socialist Alternative is culturally coming from a white dominant place, what are some of the lessons that you are learning as an organization in bringing in more POC leadership and bringing in more POC membership into the space? Right, so one of the things we, uh, we are uh, doing is, and we have been doing it, in fact, it was my own experience, like as I said, when I joined 10 years ago, there might have been one or two women, white women, but who then sort of loosely were members, but they didn't stay members for very long. And there was, there was two men of color, and then it was me, and I was the only, and I can, I think, safely say I was the only immigrant member. But my experience, and then I, and others who then sort of grew into the socialist alternative organization, then and went on to do this ourselves. But my own experience when I first joined the organization was that the leading members at that time were clearly to me, which sort of took me aback because, I, you know, when I joined, I, I expected that I would be mostly learning at first and not playing any prominent role because, you know, I, I take my own political education as seriously as as, a, as, a, as I would take you know studying mathematics you know because I, for me it's it's a it's a question of learning a science but my experience of being a socialist alternative was completely different than what I thought I was going to be doing because immediately it was clear to me that the leading members at that time were very focused on making sure that I got all kinds of opportunities to politically explore myself and develop myself and in fact pushed me onto the forefront at a time when I was resisting it myself. You know, I, I felt, well, wait I, wait a second, I'm too new. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I'm ready to represent the ideas. And they were like, no, we are totally ready. And in fact, you need to, you mm -hmm. absolutely need to. 
and that you playing a leading role will inspire other women and mm-hmm. that's exactly what happened it's not even a i mean it sounds cliched but that's exactly what happens when you know it worked <laughs> oh yeah it works <laughs> it works right i mean it it sounds yeah. cliched when you say it loud but it is the truth and that's exactly what happened it was an amazing how it was and even uh even the even the question of who should be the candidate when we first ran in 2012 and i was a member only for 3 years at that time keep in mind on top of that i was an immigrant with an accent mm-hmm. whose name nobody could say mm. right mm-hmm. and so for us for us you know uh it's it's a uh, and this is where i think it's also an effective organization organizational model to fight for to fight against marginalization within the left also because our organization doesn't say oh uh you know whoever uh, is the most who most wants the limelight will be the candidate that is not right. how it works right. in fact right. it's the opposite and i i feel like somebody who doesn't want the limelight should be yeah. uh, because then they would be true to the movement in the, in a sense oh my god a john snow harry potter <laughs> we're getting closer <laughs> 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 anyway it took a whole process yes yes Aww. but but i but the but the reason i you know i'm sort of making a joke out of it but the reason i bent to it also because it was not what i wanted to do was because it was a democratic decision of the organization and yeah. that has to be respected yeah. mm-hmm. and h- what would it be like if we ha- if working class people had that kind of party mm-hmm. where the members of the party could decide who runs for office what program you commit to and what you will actually do when you get elected and you know and and you don't dare um sell the movement out Th- imagine having that kind of accountability because that's the kind of accountability we have within our own organization and the and that was my way of uh, uh, that was my duty also towards accountability r- being willing to run even though it was completely outside what of what i wanted to do because that was a democratic decision we also uh, have a real uh, encouragement for what we call caucus work you know within mm. within mm-hmm. socialist alternative mm-hmm. we have an lgbtq caucus we have a women's caucus and the women's caucus for example many of the women or org- members will tell you it has played a real role in politically developing them building awesome. their confidence wow. and that doesn't just mean you discuss women's issues or anything like that but more it provides a framework right. where you can mm-hmm. really find yourself as an activist uh, and also a people of color caucus mm-hmm. and that has really ha- allowed also our literature to blossom like so if you look at the socialist alternative website today versus 10 years ago it has really it really shows the work we have done where the writing on issues of that are much more relevant mm-hmm. to people of color as mm-hmm. opposed to white communities has blossomed precisely because of that caucus work that's awesome i heard the entry test is hard <laughs> that's what I heard. That's the rumors. I heard it's no, really there's hard. No, there's, there's no mm-hmm. test. I heard there's no study guide. I heard there's a dance battle. So fuck it. That, uh, there's no test. No, it's it's not so much a test as in it's like uh you know it's not like a school test, but yeah, it is yeah. a political organization. Sure. We don't we don't make any bones about that. You don't um, want any spies in there either. What? No spies. I think every every so every socialist movement or any every activist movement yeah. has had spies. Yeah. Oh. oh yeah. You know, so, so I like some definitely SA spies, you think? <laughs> we might want some conspiracy theories on on <laughs> 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 who just stores them in his spies. bun. <laughs> yes. That's where all his conspiracies <laughs> are is in his bun. <laughs> yeah, the spies in awesome. the left movement. It's, it's true every it org true. has a spy. Activist class has a spy, and it's I'm not sure who it is, Bruno. but I mean look at what happened to Fred Hampton and yeah I mean the 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 history of left movements is littered with 100%. the establishment you know infiltrating then that doesn't mean we have to go around with a fear of letting people in it it just understanding that when you become a threat to the system right mm-hmm. that's going to happen and the best way of preventing that is to build a big movement mm-hmm. that is strong but you make a good point and it's that it's the black and brown socialists that get the most violence first. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. For exactly. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. As a district council member that comes with very specific challenges, um especially representing the district that you do, right? District 3 has such a rich rich history of communities of color, also, you know, racist housing laws and the whole gamut we've all talked about. So, I think being the representative of that district is very important, right? Especially being who you are. but that district has changed 
right? And something that we talked about a lot during the course of the election was, you know, you running in 2012 and the voters that were voting for you in that time is very different than mm -hmm. who was voting for you now. Um, so like, how has that relationship changed for you, you know, knowing that we know that you're accountable to the most marginalized, but being a district three council member, you're going to have to be accountable to district three issues. Um, so how's that relationship changed, you know, given the terrible gentrification that's happened in the central district? Because now those are your technically they're your constituents, too. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and first of all, you're totally right. Demographically speaking, this district is just dramatically different than the district we first ran in. And uh, obviously our first election to city council 2013 was citywide, mm -hmm. but the whole city has changed in that sense because right, it is right. gentrified. Obviously right. the epicenter has been in the core of the city where district three exists. So in that sense, also, it, it was that that was the additional component of why this was such a historic campaign for right, us. Right. Not only that we had everything, including the kitchen sink, thrown at us, mm. again, you know, by big business. Yeah. But also that demographically, uh, there was a whole section of constituents who don't share our right. standpoint on social right. justice. And and I think the so, so the approach we have used is sort of two prong. On the one hand, we uh, are uh, completely open to, and also my office is, regardless of the, you know, there's so much of a narrative that we don't do constituent work. I mean, it could not be more of a lie. We are, we ov we are overwhelmed, the community organizers in my office and I are overwhelmed with the amount of work we do. Also, doing the work of some other council members who don't respond to their constituents and then they reach out Ooh, to waiting us. waiting for the shade. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Naming no names. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so uh, so we do an overwhelming amount of work, but we are, we are actually relentless in addressing constituent questions uh, even if it's even if it may be well off constituents, but if they have a valid issue, we will absolutely push for those questions. And in fact, that is part of why also we won the election because they saw us supporting them on mm -hmm. those issues mm -hmm. in a genuine way, mm -hmm. you know, without giving up our integrity. I mean, just to give you an example, some of the uh, residents who live in Mont Lake are now deeply impacted by the 520. Uh, construction right. and many right. of them are very well off but it's also a real thing that they have a they have a major 10-year construction mm -hmm. and there there is going to be m noise that they're they're impacted by but what we but, but how we address it is by not by uh and, and we're very open and honest with them we, we don't we don't approach those issues by wanting to cater extra to the rich people mm -hmm. but more you know, uh, act on the issues that we would act regardless. Right. So in other words, what we are trying to do is develop uh, an ordinance, it's it's under process where we are not, the ordinance is not just going to talk about Montlake and the well-off people in Montlake, mm -hmm. but also the working class people on Capitol Hill right. who are impacted by the I-5 construction there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. can we bring community input for whichever community there is, which is impacted by major construction projects, which are decades long, mm -hmm. which will impact you know standards of living. Mm -hmm. However, outside of that, mm -hmm. uh, within the district, our focus is on working class issues. And you're right, Arita. You you know the the people who don't share our social justice vision are also constituents in the district, and we try our level best to find common ground, right. but on terms that don't allow us to sell out our values. Right. Yeah. But we are also not shy of saying, well, we don't agree with you on this. Yeah. And that our focus is the working class people and the marginalized in District 3. And so, for example, the work that we put into making sure that the Central Area Senior Center and Board Bar Place, which are extremely important to especially working class black and brown communities, seniors and so on. Right. We, we, didn't, we weren't shy about saying, well, this is the kind of issue we want to act on. Bringing the post office back to the central district. That's a working right. class issue. Yeah. And it's an immigrant small business issue. Fighting for Sabah Ethiopian cuisine yeah. and highlighting the need for commercial rent control. No, uh, the, the big corporate real estate people are not gonna agree with it. Again, to give you another concrete example, um, 
the for the a billionaire and former CEO of Starbucks, Howard Wright, lives in my district. I don't right. pretend he to. Does? Yes, yeah, he does do. I thought he lived in Medina, where the rest of them live. Madro- he lives in Madrona. Oh, it's close. Madrona's and so, so does Tom yeah. Alberg, who was one of the major donors of People for Seattle, the Orwellian name, People for Seattle. Gross. Millionaires against Seattle is what we yeah. like to call it. Uh, so yeah, those are those people <laughs> live in our district. We don't pretend to represent them, and we have no problem saying, no, we don't, we don't. I mean, if you. Uh, want to fight on the issues we we represent we welcome everybody but mm-hmm. we're not going to sell out because you live in the district and that is why we don't we are relentless of bringing uh, in bringing a class lens to constituent services also you know we don't we don't pretend that everybody has the same voice no it's actually it's a deeply unequal society and you can't artificially pretend that everything is equitable it's not and then the last point i'll make also is that that's why we also say you can't just represent your district this is a region wide crisis yep. Yep. and the issues we are fighting on do affect the region and we we are unabashedly trying to mobilize a movement in the region not just in the mm-hmm. district and that is why one of the for example one of the communities we work closely with is the somali and east african community mm-hmm. many of whom have been pushed out of district 3 yeah. but we still yeah. uh, organize alongside them because we consider it very important yeah in a way like keeping things compartmentalized in districts kind of keeps it especially when there's a dem- demographic mm-hmm. shift, it keeps mm-hmm. it exclusive, right? Exactly. If you keep standing by this idea that you must only represent your district, yeah. then you're going to keep moving the lines of inequality, right? It totally, it yep. totally. And imagine yeah. if every every district council member, given the alarming gentrification yeah. we've had in our city, if yeah. every district council member took that approach, exactly. then we have, nothing, we have nothing less than a council that is advocating for a playground for the wealthy because mm-hmm. every yeah. district council member exactly. wanting wealthy people to move in. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that the Green New Deal needs to have revenue, needs to be funded, right? And honestly, if we are going to have a future on this planet, climate change is an existential threat to us all. So we really know that we need to... we, We need to combat the neoliberalism that is exploiting our planet at exponential rates. So what are examples of the new economy that you've seen mm-hmm. in other parts of the world that are already being implemented now or what are your visions for Seattle and like what are some what are some um, policies that you're excited about being able to implement or movements that you think need to be replicated here in terms of the climate change issue specifically in vision. terms of climate change in terms of climate change issues or um, or just in general yeah um, well, taking taking climate change as an example, I think the bare minimum, and it's not just me, you know, the Green New Deal, Seattle Needs a Green New Deal Coalition has said this also. If we are going to do even just the bare minimum to, for Seattle's part, to do the bare minimum towards combating climate change, then we are going to have to g- make Seattle a 100% renewable energy city by 2030. I mean, that's the bare minimum. I, I, I think we have to keep saying that in our public discourse because we cannot allow the narrative to be that that's a hugely ambitious thing and that would be great. No, that's the bare minimum we need to do. We need to go well beyond that. And I want to talk about that in a second as well. But to do that, we have to uh, combat vehicular emissions and building emissions because those are the two big sources of carbon emissions generation. And that means massively expanding public transit. And yes, we have good public transit, mm-hmm. and the, everything that we have is a result of advocacy from ordinary people saying we want this. Um, and and actually, a lot of ordinary people also making a sacrifice in terms of how much time they end up spending using public transit out of a personal commitment to not drive. But that's not enough. Uh, because ultimately people are stuck in traffic snarls because they don't have charge. And it's also the lethal combination of not having enough density of public transit and then affordable housing being lost at a rapid pace, working people being pushed out farther and farther away from their jobs, being forced to commute and then being forced to, like if you live in Kent, for example, you rely on a sounder train and you're on a swing shift, you've got to drive, you have no choice. So it, it can't be a personal lifestyle question. It has to be a policy question. And so we need, yeah, I have this uh, theory. I don't know if some of you might have heard. I call it the uh, single working mom 
uh, metric of public transit like imagine a single mom who has to take care of her kids but also keep up a job if she can get through her day you know sending her kids to school go to, going to work on time because mm-hmm. she'll get fired if she doesn't go on time mm-hmm. coming yep, home yep. Uh, supervising her kids homework making them dinner putting them to bed and then doing the whole thing all over again the next day if she can do all of that purely on the basis of public transit which means she's not having to wait 40 minutes for each um, bus and doesn't have to have a circuitous route just to get to work she has easy connections for that to happen we will need a massive expansion in routes frequencies and stops of all kinds of transit light rail um, bus everything so if we if we when we if and when we reach the single mom metric we will have arrived in terms of mm. the green new deal but that will require taxing big business because how how yeah. will we expand yeah. public transit it is going to require major revenues mm-hmm. and then of course energy retrofitting of buildings right. is necessary all of this can be done we know we have the research and the expertise uh, what we don't have is revenues that is the that's why it's the first point if we want to achieve anything we have to we have to go into the new year and our movement has to be aggressive about this we want we need to tax big business because without that we're not having affordable housing and we're not getting a green new deal Mm -hmm. right right uh the most asked twitter question for you is are you all in on bernie sanders i am all in on bernie sanders she's part of the squad i have i have yes i have uh proudly endorsed bernie sanders do you think he has a chance? I absolutely think he has a yeah. chance. But it's also not an automatic thing in the sense that whether he has a chance, it's sort of a circular logic thing, like whether he has a chance or not also depends on whether there is a movement right. that fights for him. And that doesn't mean we're going to litigate the question of do we agree with him on every single thing? Obviously exactly. not. I mean, and I'm not, and he knows that and the movement knows. I've been very honest, Social Alternative has been very honest on the things we agree with him on, the things we don't agree with him on. But the point is, who has the genuine chance of defeating Donald Trump? Which is the first question that's on people's minds. Sure. As it should be. Because we are actually looking at a prospect of another four years of Trump yeah. if the Democratic oh, Party yeah. presents another, yet another yeah. corporate candidate. In fact, in, in, in other words, yeah. if you don't, if the establishment doesn't learn from its mistakes, it is going to be doomed to make mm-hmm. the same yeah. mistake. Yeah. yeah. And your win did a huge, uh, it, it helped Bernie's campaign, I believe, a lot. I, I, I believe so too. Even though it's a city council campaign, I think it confirms that it can be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You yeah. don't have to move to the right to win. As a matter of fact, that is the exact wrong thing to do. Seattle is ground zero. Oh, 100%. Yes. We had Bernie campaign staff texting us through the week of your election yeah. asking like, yeah. is Shama going to win? Is Shama going to win? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? That's oh, a wow. lot of points. That's a lot of points. And we're like, yeah, you should have sent the text message a little earlier, but we'll be okay. <laughs> No, but Good yeah, response. The, no, they, <laughs> no, they were they were really. I mean, they were rooting for you because right. obviously political beliefs align, but they also knew also the impact vote, yes. will have yes. residual effect on the national yes. conversation. No, absolutely, and it was really important that Bernie not only publicly endorsed our campaign and Sean Scott's campaign, but also used their text loop mm. to make sure people were getting out the vote. Uh, and, and you're totally right, Day. I mean, it was both because the political beliefs align, but also they understand that, you know, victories build on victories. And especially right now, the I mean, if we had, obviously we wanted all the progressives to win, but it was also clear at the same time that our campaign was in the crosshairs. Yeah. And as far as the Chamber of Commerce and Wall Street was concerned, all the other progressives could have won and if we had lost that would have been the victory yeah. for them mm-hmm. because oh. that sets the yeah. narrative and, yeah. and, and we believe that too that you were the person we needed there because you're the one that consistently pushes everyone right yeah left. and I, yeah exactly yeah. and it sounds weird saying that about i mean I'm, I'm not saying it about myself but about what my office represents yeah yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. but uh, john snow we get it <laughs> yeah we get it we get it we get it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's about the nice watch. It's this about like my, the, the good like of the realm. She took an oath. Understand. She took an oath. I get it. I get yeah. it. Mm-hmm. I love this interview, by the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, my, it's, my, it's my all-time favorite interview. We, uh, would you rather buy some marijuana at Uncle Ike's 
buy a cheeseburger at Dick's, ride an e-scooter with Egan Orion. <laughs> wait, 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 I'm not done. <laughs> Subscribe to an Amazon Prime account with your name on it. Shit, and a package shipped to your office once a week. <laughs> Which one? Once Call I do, I do have an Amazon Prime account. Oh, and, but I don't shop once a week. Oh, but I also think that. Oh, I like. Okay, go ahead, people, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, for people who want to issue, I mean, like avoid Amazon. That totally appreciate. So you're not it. fully boycotting Amazon. No, no. I mean, because for me, boycotting is a political question. Sure. I mean, you know, like the Montgomery bus boycott worked because right. it was it was a part of an organized strategy. So in in the face of. A trillion dollar corporation with uh-huh. half of U.S. households as Prime subscribers. For me to boycott Amazon, <laughs> it'll simply be uh, something that is a personally uplifting act. But you me. need your packages fast. Well, I mean, it depends <laughs> on whether you need it or not, and what sure. you need. Uh, I'm gonna need her mystery books. So, <laughs> well, we <laughs> have a we have a confession. That's why because well, I feel confession? way better. We we actually. Um, we have an Alexa in here. <laughs> so that, yeah, that, that doesn't bother me. Shama, I mean, put them on no, blast. I mean, put no. them on blast. <laughs> I mean, Myra's a purist. I mean, <laughs> Myra, Myra and Spank in what way? In what, in what way are you She's, oh, She was I, very judgmental of our Alexa, which was a gift. Which was a gift. <laughs> which was a gift. I, I, I just like putting them on edge. Christopher. But I, we're a no Amazon, no Nestle household. Okay. Yeah, that's the only thing we hold the line <laughs> That makes sense. I would never. I, I mean, ironically, but because it's so local, I would never buy marijuana from Uncle Ike's. I wouldn't step foot. I, in I that. wouldn't either. Yeah, yeah. But that, but that's the thing, though. Yeah. You know, it's sort of there. Are, there are sort of gradations and also issues that prop. Like for example, I'll tell you something. Uh, you know, UFCW twenty one did. Uh, you know, w- was campaigning alongside the United Farm Workers. You, you guys know about this. The um, the berries that were being shipped to Whole Foods. Were from 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 farms Mm -hmm. in eastern Washington, but of course the exploitation still continues. But there's real organizing work going on. So that's an example of where there's an actual organizing uh, movement, and then as part of the tactics of the movement, they bring the community with them by you know sort of they show solidarity by refusing to shop at Whole Foods. That was years ago, and I still haven't stepped into Whole Foods. Whole Foods. But the thing is. I, I've just ended up doing that, but I don't kid myself by telling myself that yeah. because I don't shop at yeah. Whole Foods, something's changing in, exactly. you know? So in that right. sense, I don't think I can uh, be dishonest enough to pretend that if I didn't shop at Amazon, somehow it's having an impact. If we had a major campaign around it, sure. which, like which boycott was- Like Prime Day, Yeah, like for example, like if, if, if there was a major unionizing drive, yeah. for example, at the warehouse workers, and as part of that, there was a day where we said, Nobody does it as part of their strike action. Totally. We should totally do it. But we should also not allow people to kid themselves on their lifestyle politics yeah. either because, mm-hmm. I mean, this is capitalism. So it's riding an How e-scooter. How many companies are going to buy boycott, right? So you're riding an e-scooter with Egan. No. Yeah. <laughs> so what are you doing? Uh, here's what I'll do. I, I'll, I'll buy a joint from Uncle Like, but somebody else will have to smoke it because I won't be able to smoke That's it. Fair. Okay, That's fair. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us on the activist class. Please don't forget to subscribe. Rate us five stars. Download the podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm still not mm-hmm. totally sure what analytic matters most in podcast world. I don't know how to track subscribers. They all seem the same to me. But just keep liking the five star thing because if you don't, people like Safe Seattle will continue to troll us. We have a five yeah. star rating, by the way. That's incredible. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. We have yeah. reviews. Wait, but Safe Seattle is trolling you? Uh, yeah. Occasionally when Spec yeah. harasses them. Good. Yeah. I see that. On, uh, I like it when Spike harasses them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.